Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for joining the Italian panel of the MPL Days 2021 organized by Didi Talks. Today, we will have a great panel bringing to the table different point of view from a seller perspective, buy side perspective, services, and consulting, discussing the key trends and the latest development on the Italian MPL market. Just a very brief introduction of the panelists that will join us today. Well, Giorgio Tito Baruero is a head of group distress asset management at Unicredit. We have Giovanni Gilli, who is chairman of Intrum in Italy and Greece. We have Francesco Buffi, who is a director at Carval Investors. Vittorio Savarese, head of structuring and loans management at Intesa San Paolo. And Alessandro Clementi, who is chairman at Webits. I would probably kick off today's discussion with Giorgio, because clearly everyone in the market is now asking what will happen in 2021, what will be the new inflows of MPLs coming to the Italian market, and how banks are really coping with expected development of the market and the increasing stock of MPLs that probably will arise in the coming months. So I would probably kick off asking Giorgio your view from a seller perspective working uh, clearly one of the leading Italian banks. What is your view on the upcoming months and what do you think is the way that banks are restructuring the strategy to cope with the upcoming MPLs over the next few months? Up to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the question. And first of all, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we are actually facing uh, uh, one of the most worrying crises uh, after the Second World War for the real economy, and this will have for sure impacts uh, into the uh, bank's uh, balance sheet. Uh, even more important is uh, the kind of issue that the banks will ex experience due to the fact that uh, a lot of countermeasure has already been uh, uh, settled in place by the, the government, by institution and by regulators. What uh, we have to assess, first of all, is not, is not the magnitude of uh, the, the issue, but uh, the, the quality and, uh, and uh, the key features of such issue. Uh, all the banks are doing their estimates and probably they embedded already the different, uh, let's say, risk countermeasure to, to such a potential future issue. And uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can see it into the PNL of the 2020 full year, whereby uh, multiple financial institutions already provision at a certain level in order to cover future losses. Uh, having said that, uh, the important part uh, of the uh, topic needs to be assessed in what happened since uh, the COVID uh, beginning. Uh, all the states, uh, and uh, I'm referring more specifically to Italy, put in place a measure to facilitate and support the real economy, as well as the financial institutions. Such measures are in the short term for sure benefit because they have been able to provide payment holiday to companies as well as financial support where needed. Uh, I'm talking about uh, such a guarantees and, uh, um, and all the, the facility that have been, uh, have been uh, provided to the system. But this uh, is creating two key um, topics. The first one is uh, that is not uh, a gradual, uh, let's say, um, classification to the bad loan like it has been in the past uh, with the previous crisis in 2008 and 2012-14, but this will be probably uh, done uh, in a, a series of steps most likely once the payment holiday will expire, there will be a first big chunk of it uh, emerging. And the second step will be regarding the, uh, let's say companies that after a payment holiday will sustain themselves with the new finance, uh, the, the state guarantee finance uh, for a while. And then uh, due to also the change of the economic tissue of, of Italy probably will experience issue and then probably drift to a worst uh, credit worthiness uh, status, meaning uh, UTP or bad loans. These topics needs to be addressed by the bank uh, in, uh, in two stages. First of all, now we need to understand how to minimize the number of companies and borrowers that will uh, drift 
to uh, uh, UTP and to bad loans by implementing countermeasure and also specific action plan with the, the borrowers. Uh, and, and second will be the management of such flows to uh, MPE. The management of such flow to MPE, no one has, has the, the, the special source already, but we are all, I think, working on the key uh, elements of it. First of all, we will have to face uh, multiple uh, um, complexity provided the fact that uh, um, the vast majority of the borrowers that will go to default in the second stage will be assisted by public guarantee. And this uh, will uh, have impacts on timing and ability to recover because such companies uh, will have also the state somehow uh, stepping into the credit uh, restructuring process, for example. So those two, in my opinion, are the big uh, challenges that we will have to face as a uh, uh, banking system in Italy in the next uh, year and uh, uh, probably also the, the following uh, uh, few years. Thanks, Giorgio. Very interesting. I think you, you definitely touched some of the points that everyone in the market is, uh, is asking also to organize the structure going forward. The first one is the expected increase of NPLs. Clearly, there are different views in the number, the credit moratoria is somehow mitigated the evolution of the NPL stock over the, the latest months, but every, everyone is aligned that clearly in 2021, in particular in the second part of the year, we will see an increasing stock of NPL coming to the market. And then I think the, clearly the role of the servicers is definitely uh, expected to, to become still more relevant going forward. And we are already seeing uh, banks that are working with some of them to find specific solution for uh, new asset classes to manage probably the SME part of the book that is, uh, has been uh, uh, quite reduced so far, but it's going to have an increasing importance going forward. So probably I would go to Giovanni asking, what is your view uh, on the expected development from a services perspective? And how do you think services should change the business model and the strategies to help banks uh, managing effectively the new stock of MPL coming to the market? Thank you, Luca. Thank you and pleasure being with you. Uh, let me tell you, first thing, uh, fortunately enough, now we have an NPL industry, which was not the case last time. So that at least I think is an advantage for everybody in order how to cope properly with, with the crisis. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, I think that we, we, we can confirm that to a certain extent that the servicing industry is uh, counter cyclical in this phase. Uh, and someone could even think that the servicing industry is to a certain extent going to benefit uh, from, from, from the crisis in terms of activity. That's true, meaning that we are expecting, of course, an increase in volumes, but be careful uh, in an environment which will be much, much more challenging for the services too. Uh, the recovery activity uh, will be more difficult, complicated, uh costly to a certain extent so my point is that we will have to cope with larger volumes but we will probably have to uh, improve the management of the margins in order to maintain the proper equilibrium so the as as you were mentioning the business model is is must change and services must uh, put a real effort in doing that i i, I can briefly uh, underline five five different lines of intervention which in my eyes are key uh, to be a success so as, uh, to, to have a success in, in this situation for, for the service. Uh, I would say first one is, is a review of the uh, recovery strategies um, different from, from the past. Uh, let me uh, be concise out uh, of tribunals, trying to work as much as possible uh, out of tribunals, uh, directly uh, negotiating uh, uh, extrajudicial agreement with 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 that that's the key message uh, second is um the importance of uh, uh let's say innovation and it uh, how to to work properly with the the, the data and with the uh, objective of improving uh capacity of uh, select and prioritize the actions uh number three touching directly on, on, on the efficiency uh, issue uh, to review and have a sort of uh, lean approach to production. What I'm saying is that uh, a big effort is needed in order to review all the processes, assignment of portfolios, uh, 
getting efficiency, efficiency, efficiency from a, a deep, deep uh, and thorough review of all the operational processes. Uh, another point uh, which is key is uh, uh, to, to be able to, to widen the, the product offer. I mean, we have been typically oriented uh, towards the management of uh, NPLs. Uh, now the NP concept is larger. We are talking about UTP, we are talking about high risk. So the approach uh, uh, is, is, is much wider to, to help banks uh, and investors to cope with, with the issue. Uh, last but not least, there's something on which I, I really uh, I, I stress it a lot. Uh, we have a uh, drastic change uh, in the skills that are needed in the industry. I mean, we were coming from a situation in which legal skills were dominant. I mean, uh, all the teams were made up by by uh, legal or, or uh, credit legal uh, people with, with a very defined uh, competence like that. Now we need much more. We need uh, people uh, expert in industry, in single industry, in real estate, uh, in structuring. So you understand that it's, it's, it's a big, big change uh, in how we, we, we direct uh, the, the enlargement of skills in the industry. It's, it's, it's an important ch challenge. Uh, as you can see, these are uh, relevant uh, changes uh, and, and uh, it will determine very much who will be successful and, and who will be uh, less successful in the next uh, in the next round. Thanks, Giovanni. Clearly, very comprehensive overview of the key challenges that the servicing industry should uh, uh, cope with over the next couple of months and years. But yeah, there is yeah. one one point that I've taken. Clearly, you you comment on the status of the MPL industry that compared to the previous crisis is now very well developed, really, uh, from a bank's perspective, investor's perspective, service and advisors, it's clear to everybody that the, the position of the industries of today is completely different from the one that we had in uh, uh, 2014 or 2015 when the larger transaction in Italy kicked off. But there is one point that uh, many people in the market are, are currently discussing. It is the, probably the coldest stance that uh, international investors are having in the Italian market compared to the past. And uh, so given that we have Francesco joining the panel, I would be keen to have uh, his view clearly representing the international investors today on the panel. What is his view on the uh, Italian market, the opportunities that will lie ahead of us? And what is the feedback from uh, an international perspective? Because clearly we've been told, we've been saying for a while that uh, last year probably we've seen more lo local investors than international ones, but I'm keen to have your views on the expected development going forward. Oh, thanks. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for the question, for the question, Luca. Um, that's, a, that's a very, that's a very uh, broad point. I think uh, uh, there's certainly an element uh, at, at the beginning of each cycle where the opportunities uh, uh, open up globally and, and, and international investors uh, tend to reassess uh, uh, the various, the various opportunities and uh, um, and, and also tend to be uh, a little bit more cautious uh, at, at the beginning at the beginning of each cycle. But having said that, I think that uh, uh, certainly the Italian the Italian NPL market is still fairly uh, ranks still fairly high in uh, in, uh, in international investors' priority. Um, I think if I if I think at uh, three of the key elements when, when you assess the market, right, expected supply, the infrastructure, and uh, and the level of competition, the, the scenario looks uh, certainly interesting, although not 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 fully obvious for, 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 on certain elements. I think uh, um, on the first two points, uh, both both Giorgio and and, and Giovanni have touched already, but the uh, supply uh, supply is there. Consensus is for for for. Uh, uh, 50 to 100 billion increase in, uh, in in potential stock. There is a, I expect also uh, um, quite a healthy volumes from uh, from all the transactions that have been uh, uh, completed in the last two three years. We, 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 the, over 200 billion of uh, of stock has traded uh, over the last two three years, and uh, that stock needs to be needs to be moved. So the supply the supply is certainly there. Uh, the, the loans of moratoria, as you were touching on before, um, 
and it's certainly key element that makes the market interesting. Uh, the infrastructure, as uh, as you have mentioned earlier, and 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 and, uh, and Giovanni and Giovanni touched on as well, uh, is there as well. But from the seller side, I think there's uh, uh, different from uh, from the, the the first period of the great financial crisis of the last cycle. The banks that have stronger balance sheets that uh, uh, are subject to higher regulatory pressures or more pressure itself, and uh, that uh, have uh, processes in place to uh, better manage uh, the, the NPL and the cycle early on, and also to produce a better information set to investors, which is uh, of utmost importance. Um, and also more forward thinking, if I if I if I may uh, say something nice about banks again. Uh, because uh, you know, as uh, as as Giorgio was mentioning earlier, we've seen them provisioning uh, quite a bit in advance to anticipate the COVID impact that uh, they're not seeing yet because of uh, all the, the the protection schemes that uh, that are that are still that are still in place. Um, and the servicing infrastructure is uh, is a uh, uh, that of a mature market as well. Um, Giovanni was 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 touching on. Uh, uh, the necessary changes in the business model, which I, I agree with, but uh, I think the starting point is certainly that of a, of a mature industry, which again gives confidence to uh, to, to investors. Um, the last point that I mentioned earlier, competition. Uh, now we are, we are coming out of a cycle where uh, the lion's share was uh, was for some local players, as you were mentioning earlier, uh, perhaps with the positive light cost of capital competing with the uh, large international DCAs. We've seen a, uh, a big uh, chunk of government intervention, um, thinking GAX and thinking AMCO. Uh, and so funds have been uh, left uh, early on with uh, very sizable transactions, a uh, few funds going uh, fairly aggressively um, and or uh, especially in the later part of the cycle, um, focusing on niche asset classes or, or, or mid-market transactions where uh, complexity was perhaps a little higher and, uh, and bottom of the lateral and, and, and legal standpoint. It's not 100% not clear to me how things will shape, will shape up going forward from a competition standpoint. There is a question mark, I think. Um, certainly, we would see probably a, a different approach from the uh, poly banking players, given also the, the regulatory evolutions and perhaps a more cautious approach of uh, uh, some of the large investors that have become big in the last cycle and now are dealing with it. Um, but on the other hand, you, you, you've seen also record levels of, uh, of fundraising in the industry and, and therefore liquidity is going to be there and competition is going to be, going to be certainly there. So, I mean, to conclude, uh, Positive view on the size, positive view on the infrastructure of data, as Giovanni was saying, uh, uh, in, in evolution as, as needed. Uh, there are a question mark in, on competitions. Competition is going to be there. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's certain. Uh, last point on, uh, on timing. I think uh, we're going to see a different shape of, uh, of, the, of the curve versus the last crisis uh, for the reasons that we mentioned uh, earlier. Um, the market is more ready to to, uh, to transact and uh, and to take on uh, uh, acquisitions. Uh, the banks are more ready because they have better uh, provision and have got stronger balance sheets. The servicing infrastructure is there, so um, I would expect this uh, the, the the peak of the transactions to unravel in uh, in a two three years time rather than uh, in five years that, that that we see on the on the last on the last uh, the last time around. Thanks, Francesco. I, um, I fully agree with some of the points you mentioned. Clearly, there are still many uh, moving pieces of the puzzle that should uh, develop over the next couple of months. But clearly, the, the size of the market, and also looking backward at the, at the volumes that has been traded just after the COVID outbreak, I think make us confident that there will be opportunity for a large number of investors. It's, it's just a matter probably of finding out in which asset class, which sort of transaction, different investors should position ourselves better. One point that you mentioned is the uh, the government support and uh, also clearly the the GAC scheme has been very successful and also the uh, the market has been very active in particular over the uh, last months of the 2020. In uh, in December we've seen many GAC transactions being finalized by banks, new asset classes for securitization like leasing. So the market has been very active and the uh, banks are already working on 
and other GAX transaction. And also if uh, now potential extension of the, uh, of the government guarantee is still under discussion, I think that also in 2021, the GAX scheme will be relevant in the market. So I, I would ask Vittorio, from a structural point of view, what is your perception of the securitization market and what do you think will be the, uh, the GACs and the usage of this scheme that will be implemented by the banks going forward? Uh, thanks, Luca. Uh, good afternoon to everybody and thanks for uh, inviting me to join this panel. Uh, you are right. I mean, from my uh, point of view, which is the point of view of uh, uh, an arranger and uh, advisor to uh, sellers in their uh, uh, the leveraging structure uh, in the leveraging strategies, uh, I think that 2020 was quite uh, an interesting year. Uh, you are right uh, uh, when you say that uh, basically. Uh, uh, until uh, the month of December and the final year of Russia, uh, we have seen just uh, three uh, significant GAX transactions and uh, very few other uh, the leveraging uh, transactions of MPLs. And uh, uh, for me, the reason was uh, that basically uh, on one side, banks were more focused on uh, uh, protecting themselves from the impact of the COVID. So, uh, uh, to cope with uh, uh, the uh, uh, different uh, guarantee schemes for new for new lending on one side, and on the other side, I guess that uh, I mean we uh, felt that many banks were worried about uh, possible impact in terms of uh, pricing when they uh, sell the MPLs uh, due to the uh, to this crisis. Uh, I think that the change uh, with regard to this last point has been. Uh, the very few trends, uh, actually a couple of transactions, so one of which uh, we, we, we arranged that uh, uh, came into the market uh, in between uh, July, June and July, basically showing uh, to the market that uh, despite of the crisis, uh, the impact in, term of, in terms of the pricing of uh, GAX transactions was uh, quite limited. Uh, I, would, uh, I would say that probably uh, I mean, the, the impact of the COVID in terms of business plan and IRR for the investors uh, have accounted for probably not more than one or two uh, percentage points in terms of uh, uh, GBV. And that uh, gave the boost uh, to a new wave of transactions. And uh, December was quite an interesting month uh, with uh, seven transactions have been uh, uh, brought to the market. Uh, uh, we arranged uh, three of them, uh, and basically the uh, uh, legacy of uh, those transactions uh, in terms of uh, uh, outcome, uh, I would say probably I would highlight the three main uh, takeaways. One of which uh, you have already mentioned, which is the introduction of uh, uh, a new asset class, uh, which is the leasing. We have here uh, Giorgio from Unicredit, which was one of the originators of uh, uh, those, new, uh, those new transactions. And I think this is uh, an important point positive for uh, uh, the um, um, uh, um, pipeline for the, for the next years, because basically the fact that we know now that uh, also an as a complicated asset class as, as the leasing has been understood uh, by rating agencies uh, could give uh, uh, the chance to other banks to uh, address this asset class. The second one, I would say the multi-originator structure, which is another important characteristic of the 2020 transactions, in the sense that uh, basically uh, many uh, medium small banks that uh, could not achieve uh, uh, the results in terms of uh, the leveraging, in terms of uh, exit price uh, uh, that uh, other banks could have uh, from, uh, from GAX, uh, uh, could enter into this market uh, uh, participating to multi-originator uh, uh, transactions. Uh, only in 2020, I think we have seen uh, three or four multi-originator transactions. Uh, and once again, I think that these uh, will be a light motive for the uh, upcoming years, because basically uh, probably some big banks have done uh, their own works. So uh, from them, the volume of uh, MPL transactions could uh, reduce while multi-originator is opening this market to other, uh, to other banks. 
And basically the third uh, uh, takeaway from 2020 is actually a result of uh, uh, the other two, meaning that uh, uh, GAX has been uh, uh, proved to be an efficient scheme uh, in my belief uh, of, uh, for sure for the sellers because uh, I would say that it is all, uh, almost clear to everyone that uh, regardless to the asset class, so secured, unsecured, the leasing, whatever, uh, when you deliver through a GAX, uh, GAX transaction, basically you can achieve the, the highest price. Uh, so basically, I would say that for uh, uh, the upcoming uh, uh, year 2021, actually we will uh, take this point once again, but for the time being, I would say, I would expect uh, still other uh, transactions to go through the GAX scheme. Uh, the only reason why I would say banks could, could uh, prefer not to use GAX is just because maybe they have uh, uh, used the 2020 to give to 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 make a huge uh, um, uh, valuation of the of the of their portfolio. So basically, there is the limit uh, in the GAX uh, um, in the GAX law for which uh, you cannot sell uh, with uh, with a plus. Uh, therefore, if a bank has uh, 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 is value, um, dev devaluated the, the portfolio a lot, uh, it could uh, have this, uh, this, this issue. Otherwise, I would say that uh, for sure, GAX would, uh, would remain the best uh, solution. So we do hope that uh, uh, in May, when uh, the GAX decree will, uh, will end, they will uh, renew it. Uh, and we are looking forward uh, to see if uh, there is uh, uh, some uh, uh, amendments in the law that uh, could include also UTP that uh, would, uh, I, I guess, become a very uh, significant game changer. Vittorio, if I may, Giorgio speaking, uh, if I may, one, one point to make a little bit more dynamic our, our conversation. I fully agree with the, with the statement that GAX is uncomparable in terms of uh, let's say funding cost and that makes the price extremely appealing. Uh, but uh, just to elaborate a little bit about that uh, uh, with our eyes, which we, we sorted out most of our uh, legacy uh, issues in terms of asset quality, I see it as a way to clean uh, the, the legacy. And, and this stops once you, you solve the legacy. For, for new flows, for example, we, we, we are thinking about we identified a solution since a couple of years that the market is it's a better solution due to the fact that it's more flexible with less scale. You do not have the um, yeah, very high cost uh, related to GAC. So I, I would see your statement super correct uh, to clean the, the, um, the legacy, but in terms of uh, uh, going forward and looking forward to the recovery, as, uh, as also Giovanni said before, we may uh, want to use more flexible tools other than uh, the, the GAX, which is a very, very useful and economically um, optimized instrument, but uh, for, for la large portfolio and for the past. That, that was my, my idea about that. I don't know if you share it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, completely, I completely agree. I mean, uh... I think that actually uh, we have benefited by the uh, GAX instrument in many ways, because basically, as I was saying, for banks uh, to achieve higher price uh, for the service uh, that you were mentioning before, I think also GAX was beneficial because it helped uh, to create uh, these, uh, these uh, servicing market. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I agree with you. Uh, and uh, as I was saying, uh, I believe that uh, there could be the chance for some big banks that have uh, used the uh, GAX uh, structure to deliver uh, some uh, uh, specific part of their portfolio. I believe that for them, uh, there could be space to do the leveraging with other uh, scheme uh, which are not uh, GAX. So this is why I was saying that probably I see GAX more for uh, small medium banks uh, around the aggregator that uh, could help them uh, uh, in a multi-originator structure to achieve the benefit of the GAX, uh, while probably uh, big banks like you, like us, uh, could use uh, other uh, uh, leverage to deliver uh, 
uh, specific portfolios that maybe could not be so beneficial in terms of uh, gag structure. Thanks, Victoria. I think clearly you mentioned leasing one, like one of the key asset class, but in general, what you are seeing is that an increasing focus on finding new solution, new structure for the secure part of the MPL books. So now I'm keen to have a service and advisor perspective, probably asking at Alessandro, what is his view on the uh, expected development and the future of the upcoming MPL market with a specific focus on uh, leasing, given that we, we've been discussing about this asset class and more in general around secure, where probably a more diversified approach by kind of assets, region and size should be developed going forward. Up to you, Alessandro. Thank you, Luca, for the question. Hello, everyone. So uh, firstly, I think that uh, the first good news is that we are still here talking about coming market asset and price that it wasn't for grant uh, like 10 months ago. <laughs> this is, looks good to me. And so coming to your question, um, according to the main institution research center, the European economy will recover already this year. Uh, after a drop of 7% in the 2020. The rebound will be uh, around uh, 5% in the course of the 2021 and another uh, 4% in the 2022. Uh, according to the same research, the growth of the Italian GDP has been sluggish uh, in the first quarter of this year but we start to run for the rest of the 2021, getting close to the European average. So the resource deployed by European Union in the national economies through the recovery fund uh, will foster consumption and production. And I believe that this time European countries has a great opportunity, as only we had after WW2, to trigger a um, huge investment plan across, across the country, boosting the European partnership uh, with a direct effort in the national economies. Concer concerning the financial and bank system, I think that this time Italian lenders are better capitalized respect to 2008 crisis. And even a European regulator seems to have a softer attitude towards bank. Uh, for, a, for example, European Central Bank has reduced the requirement for risk market. And as well, the previous Italian government has allowed banks to use the DTA, the fair tax asset, in order to mitigate the loss in MPL disposal. Uh, focusing on our industry, uh, we know that it took us a good part of 10 years to get a large and disciplinated MPL market with the standardized procedures, technologies, quality of data, strong players. And this industry has shown resilience and has been able to face the worst part of the crisis. So last year, we had like 42 billion of transaction which at the end is only 4.5% 4, 4. less uh, the previous year. Nevertheless, we also should be aware that uh, the, in the pre-coronavirus era, the Italian NPL market was considered was one of the few remaining markets where investors could realize a sizable trade at interesting yield. This mainly because the MPL Italian market was uh, still very large with big transaction happening on both primary and secondary market. In a post coronavirus environment, we can expect this dynamic change a bit with uh, a large trade happening on both sides of the Atlantic and likely the Italian MPL market will have to compete with uh, other performing and non-performing market uh, uh, in Europe and in the US. Uh, in my personal experience in last month, I see uh, some new factor. Firstly, um, 
reduction of price expectation for some uh, seller. And secondly, uh, investor, which I never done before, uh, available to step in in pure real estate transaction. Uh, of course, asset coming from a distressed situation or asset uh, coming from a specific situation where uh, value add strategies is applicable. But by the way, this investor today believe that it's possible to achieve in poor real estate transaction the same yield they were used to get in uh, uh, MPL portfolios. This probably because also fostered by the recent law on um, the securitization on art asset. By the way, I believe that for these dynamics, the, the Italian PL market, which has been until last year a um, sales side market, is now switching a buyer side market. Uh, concerning the, the underline of the MPL portfolio, uh, of the secured MPL portfolio, which are, by the way, like the 80% of the MPL exposures, uh, according to the main expert, for example, in the last outlook uh, by CBRE, um, the, the pandemic has uh, speed up some specific trends that we were already underway before the crisis. So, for example, the, the logistic asset class has increased the volume last year with 1.4 billion transactions, the residential after a drop of 30% in throughout the first lockdown, uh, started to recover in the second part of the 2020. And uh, we expect uh, also uh, hotels will start to recover in the second part of this year. Uh, this also cause uh, public, strong public policy are, su are supporting the sector, which is the establishment of the, a specific ministry with a budget. It's, it's the first step. Of course, uh, all the retail asset and um, office are struggling. Uh, the retail is struggling also in Ninth Street, Prime City, uh, given to the stop of the touristic flows. And for office, of course, has been affected by, by the spread of the smart working. And it's hard to understand which will be the supply in, in the future, the supply of uh, large office spaces. By the way, we can expect that the real estate market in the in the in these years will be the volume will be between the 2019 record and the 2020 um, figures. Uh, really much depend up, up, uh, on the resolution of the pandemic crisis and the vaccination plans uh, that we will be able to put in place. Thank you, Alessandro. I, I think we have already brought to the table a lot of points to be discussed further. So uh, I will probably go with a quick second round of comments, probably starting again from Giorgio, given that we mentioned a lot the investors' appetite and the competitive tension in the market. You, you've been uh, probably one of the uh, more active sellers, not only last year, but over the last six, seven years in the Italian market. So what's your views on what's happening and what do you think will be the, the focus going forward of the investors? Thanks for the question, Luca. I, I will pick up uh, from the past, if, uh, if I may. So I will start uh, from a couple of forward, uh, backward looking, meaning that we are thinking about what we have seen in the past. So the last seven years, as you mentioned, of activity as Unicredit, uh, uh, in terms of disposal, as well as uh, what we have seen in 2020. And, and the outcome is fairly interesting, probably to streamline what we are seeing and will see in 2021. The first point relates uh, to what uh, Giovanni already uh, mentioned uh, about the sophistication of the servicing market, as well as uh, the diversification of it. And this ties to competition because the real bottleneck I always identified into this market are the servicer. The servicer has been over the last seven years, the real funnel in which the investor have to access to portfolio, especially the large one. 
uh, and the, this panel is, is getting larger. So it's creating space for competition. This is the first point. Second point is about uh, uh, what also um, Vittorio was mentioning uh, regarding uh, the activity in, uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, 2020. And uh, if we see pretty much 70% of the transaction, the GBV volumes moved, happen in the fourth quarter. This means that most of the financial institution banks in Italy has been waiting. They were waiting about the COVID, the impacts, uh, as well as they are trying to spot a right market, um, uh, let's say, area to, to attack and to sell their portfolio. This means that uh, in the end, the banking system, despite the COVID, has to still clean up uh, and uh, uh, sell debt uh, in terms of MPE. So the real, the real point is that independently from the market condition, the financial institution will have also in 2021 to achieve uh, the, the, um, the targets in terms of MPE ratio and volumes um, of the overall, overall arching uh, uh, risk appetite framework, as well as ECB regulation, and uh, also um, the, the, the shareholders that are pushing the banks to have certain threshold that, that, that are physiological and not uh, uh, the, the cumulative of the legacy. So these two points combined are creating, uh, again, uh, supply and demand and tension for 2021. The other two points which are uh, um, uh, important uh, are relating to the fact that Italian servicer and investor has been very active in 2020. And, and this created an important base for self-sustainability of the market in Italy. There have been a few real uh, players that have been buying uh, most of the medium, small portfolio. And this is uh, uh, very healthy for the system. And there is another big uh, point that sometimes we forget about, but uh, the large investment uh, are, are somehow in competition with the GAX because GAX is creating the leverage behind it. But uh, the equity piece uh, usually is fairly small. And uh, so the combined effect of these four points, sophistication of the market, increasing the, the, the possibility to access to the market for investor, uh, as well as uh, uh, the, the GAX that is lowering down the barrier to entry because investor can buy, let's say, easy paper, not end zone, because you have already the servicer, the master servicer, special servicer, and you have the structure that is already done. So we are creating the right environment to have also a good competition in 2021, and this can be only beneficial. And the last point of competition, which goes in the opposite direction, is that the investor needs to be careful because also banks as highlighted already by, by Vittorio before, are getting more and more sophisticated themselves, not only in selling, but also in managing and collecting their portfolio because they do not have anymore that, that huge amount of loans that they were uh, managing before uh, 2012, but they have probably the right scale, the right uh, effort and attitude within the institution to manage certain area of portfolio. So I don't see the, the need for all the banks to sell indiscriminately all their asset class, but whereby they find their performance, and now it's simple to, to benchmark performance around, their performance to be at or above market. Uh, there is the possibility that banks for capital efficiency as well uh, would, would retain their, uh, their uh, NPEs and they will serve it to themselves in order to maximize collection and benefit over time. Thanks, Giorgio. Uh, what I'm surprised that has been a, uh, a topic that we, we haven't mentioned so far is UTP. Clearly everyone in Italy knows that the, the key challenge would be on the UTP management. And uh, from our perspective, we're already seeing an increase of restructuring of Mises companies. So at some point, clearly the role of the investors, the role of the contribution fund, specialized player will becoming a bit more relevant. So asking Francesco from an investor's perspective, what do you think that the key opportunities will we, we lie ahead of us from an industry perspective? Thanks for the very easy question, Luca. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, well, I mean, UTP, as you say, UTP has been uh, has been a big theme also of the of, of the last part of uh, of the of the of, of the pre-COVID era of the previous cycle, if you want, and uh, and it certainly it certainly will be for 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 the for the near future. With uh, and we mentioned earlier the, the the amount of loans that are currently in payment holidays and in moratoria, and uh, it's it's uh, uh, it's fair to expect that uh, uh, it. it the portion of those uh, uh, will, uh, will, will become will become UTP, um, and certainly COVID as as uh, as uh, and the pandemic has introduced uh, uh, an additional an additional theme versus uh, what we, we we were facing before before the pandemic, i.e. a different a different uh, sectors being uh, being impacted in different ways, and uh, and therefore you know, expectations for recovery uh, changing sector by sector. So. Um, you know, if you're asking me what uh, what are the sectors that uh, that uh, uh, could be more interesting, um, I'll have to give you a, a bit of a general bit of a general answer. But you can you can you can dis distinguish into three four categories, I think. Uh, so that there are those sectors that uh, that have been resilient to during the pandemic, and I'm thinking, uh, and, and, and as Alessandro was mentioning as well, logistics uh, or, or pharma, for example, or the production and distribution of food or energy. Um, I think on, on these sectors, uh, uh, apart from some uh, from some exceptions, uh, uh, I, I don't see near term opportunities because you know uh, there's no real stress or distress valuations are, are, are pretty healthy. So for investors like us, probably. Um, not, 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 not huge opportunity set laying out. Um, then there are the sectors that have suffered severely from the pandemic, and and they either uh, will need more time to, to to rebound, like fashion, for example, which is fairly big in Italy, or, or they may suffer from uh, long term impacts and and, and structural changes. And uh, again, uh, uh, quoting uh, part of what Alessandro was saying earlier, uh, retail, uh, office, real estate. Uh, those are all all sectors that uh, that will struggle for a bit, and that don't see them being a uh, short-term target. I think um, the sectors that uh, that actually will attract probably more attention from uh, in, in the next month, in the in, in the near future, are those sectors that have been severely impacted, and for which you can expect a bit of a quicker rebound um, than than the others. And uh, again. Tourism, hotels, food service, construction, certain construction, for example, like five Razi and, and and logistics as well. Um, so that's that. Those are the sectors I think will uh, will uh, uh, will attract most of the attention of funds like uh, like us. Um, there is an, another category that I would I would quote uh, that are those sectors that uh, uh, will attract uh, the lion's share of the investment from the from the recovery fund. I think all of us have, have, have read and, and, and listened to, to our to the new premiers uh, prime minister's uh, uh, speech and statements and uh, sectors like renewable renewables uh, infrastructure healthcare would would all attract a lot of uh, uh, of the of the recovery fund uh, uh, money. Um, there is a big caveat here. Some of the valuations in these sectors already already reflect that. So you know, it's got to be fairly specific and and uh, and selected. Um, what, what, one other point I wanted to touch on on the UTP, and uh, you know, I think that uh, you know, despite a, um, uh, some large transactions that we've seen in the in the in, in the last two years, and uh, uh, and uh, and some others been been been, uh, been announced, I think that the large portfolio Transaction is uh, essentially only an intermediate step to, to the uh, um, to the solution of the UTP problem in Italy. I think the real way to really unlock values in, in UTP opportunities uh, is to, to, to via the development of, of an array of, on one end, specialized investors and on the other end, specialized services and operating partners, each focusing on a very limited number of sectors. As, as Giovanni was saying earlier, I think there is uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, a very wide skill set needed for this asset class from both asset business and and legal perspective. That you, I, I don't think that the one size fits all uh, solution is a solution. So uh, the, the large portfolio trades, I think, are just an intermediate step towards towards unlocking this value. And encouragingly enough, I think there is a. a there is a, a trend that is developing in that direction. There is a creation of a, 
uh, dedicated specialized uh, uh, funds uh, for, for certain sectors of UTPs. There are uh, skills developed, uh, being developed uh, either in small and niche services or even within the larger services that are developing their specific skills to, um, to manage, to manage uh, UTPs and specific sectors. Thank you, Francesco. Clearly, you mentioned specialized players, and it came to my mind the role of partnership between banks, investors, and servicers to manage a specific asset class. Clearly, Giovanni, while at Intesa, has been uh, leading some of the most relevant partnerships in Italy, both on the UTP side, but clearly uh, also with a large MPL partnership with Intrum. So, very briefly, in the, I will ask Giovanni, what do you think, based on your experience, there would be the helping part of the solution to manage the, the issue going forward? Yes, well, first of all, uh... Happy to hear what just uh, uh, George and Francesco were saying about the role of the services, because this is a good recognition by the other players of the market. So <laughs> good for us. <laughs> no, apart, from, apart, apart jokes. I mean, uh, no, the, the, the joint venture issues issue is, is important. Um, clearly, the servicer is not uh, a common uh, supplier in this phase to banks and investors. I mean, the management of of NPE is so critical right now that uh, we 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 need something more. We have to upscale the role because, on the other hand, it's not as is buying you know books or, or tables uh, from someone else out of the market. Um, so again, the joint venture is 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 a, is an answer to that, uh, an answer which really uh, develop partnership, uh, which is a different a different concept with respect to to normal supply. Um, uh, I think that we have seen uh, very good examples of that with good results in NPL up to now. I mean, we've done one, but not the only one. And, and I think the results are, 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 are very open and very transparent. Um, now, the, the next challenge is probably how, how to build this uh, for the other asset classes, meaning uh, UTP and even, even other, other, other uh, situations. So the idea is how, how to widen the concept. But basically, uh, the concept has, has proved to, 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 uh, to, to give a lot of benefits and, and it's really a lot of com complementarity between, between the, the players. Uh, if I may, if I have still uh, two minutes, let me just uh, underline a couple of do's, I normally call it do's and don'ts, uh, having gone through one significant transaction in that way. So let me just give some hints and, and let me see that, tell that uh, in terms of do's, uh, in order to have a joint venture that works well, there are two or three important things. Number one uh, is, uh, I mean, it's, it's good. I think it's important to partner with a real industrial play. I mean, if you want to upgrade the, 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 the activity, uh, the industrial, uh, uh, let's say, soul of, of the servicer, uh, it, it is absolutely relevant. And uh, a couple to that, uh, to have a long-term view. I mean, building up a joint venture in managing uh, NTEs is not uh, a, a medium or sh even short-term kind of exercise. I mean, you have to build it on a, on, on, on a let's say, time frame which goes uh, into years and years. So the, the stability of the players involved is key. Um, another point that I would say is important that the, the stake of the bank within the joint venture should be significant. Normally is a minority stake, but it makes a hell of a difference having and, and controlling 49, 40% or whatever uh, with respect to having a 10%. I mean, it, it, Believe me, it, it, it's, uh, it's changing. It, it's a different thing. And, and that uh, really put the two, the two partners at a level which can be beneficial. In terms of don'ts, things that have to be handled carefully, let me tell you, um, th there is normally an interface between the, 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 the bank and, and, the, and the investor and, and the servicer. Do not uh, underestimate the role of the interface. Uh, you need... Uh, People, skilled people that, that can help uh, the, two, the two partners to, to talk and, 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 and have a good relationship. Uh, be careful not to have too limited delegation to the servicer. The bank uh, has to control, of course, the key elements of, of the transactions, of the business plans, and, and have 
very, very thorough view on that, but uh, leave some delegating power to the services. On the other hand, uh, to the services. On the other hand, uh, the activity is, is really at risk of, of being too, too, uh, <laughs> too heavy and too difficult to develop. Finally, be careful on the financial structure of, of, of the transactions because we are talking about assets that are not easy to, to deal with. So I wouldn't push the financial structure too much in terms of, uh, you know, stretching it then. Uh, this is a sort of very quick summary of, of the issue, if this is enough. Thanks, Giovanni. You know, clearly is a topic that uh, we can discuss for, for long, but it's uh, very interesting to have your uh, key challenges and key issue that should be overcome to, to have the solution really uh, working effectively. In the interest of time, I would probably just have quick comments to Vittorio Alessandro, to some of the areas that has not been mentioned so far. So probably starting with Alessandro, you know, the, uh, as you have partly say, the market has been uh, somehow uh, focused on the impact of the moratoria going forward and uh, all the uh, political action and also the, uh, the, the option that has been given by banks for the different kind of uh, solution to tackle the COVID crisis and somehow reduce the impact uh, as of today of the NPL stock in the market. What is your view on the development and what would be the impact on asset quality when the moratorium will be concluded and probably the market will come back to a more regular stabilized trends? Yeah, thank you, Luca. I try to uh, answer to this question in a very quick way. Uh, the effort done by the previous government with the liquidity decree, a plan of uh, 750 billion, among which 300 billion for the moratoria and 200 billion for the government guarantees uh, via SASHE, has uh, the effect to push liquidity in the economic fabric supporting uh, families and uh, companies to achieve, uh, to obtain credit. I believe that these measures have uh, a positive effect in, um, in bonus situation, but only an undelayed and indirect effect on uh, MPL portfolio cash flow. Uh, rather, I think that these measures are affecting together to the stop of court activities are affecting the recovery strategies of banks, investors, and servicers as uh, the downgrade of some uh, GAX deal as shown in the past month. So to conclude, I, I think that <clears throat> in this short time, we will have a positive effect uh, somehow we have been able to avoid a credit crunch, which is uh, highly unlikely estimated by the main economic uh, institution. But we, do, can know, we don't know uh, which could be the consequence in mid-long term. For example, if we think to the depreciation curve of a leasing asset, uh, it's clear to me that the problem will be bared by the lenders in the mid-long term. Thanks, Alessandro. Probably just to conclude, uh, Vittorio, given all the topics and trends that we've been hearing, from your perspective, what will be the development of the market in terms of structured solution and in terms of probably new transactions that we will bring to the market in 2021 and beyond to help banks effectively conclude the leveraging strategies? Quite uh, a tough task to conclude that is. Uh incredible panel. Uh, well, basically, uh, I think 2021 will be a strange year for, a strange year for basically two, two reasons. The first one is uh, the fact that uh, obviously we have the moratoria still going on until uh, June and uh, don't know if they will also extend up to uh, end, uh, year end. But obviously, uh, I mean, with the moratoria standing, we should not see any uh, flow of uh, uh, deteriorated asset in 2021. So I guess that uh, 
in terms of the leveraging uh, strategies, what I can see is that the banks that maybe have done uh, not so much in the past, uh, they can do something in 2021, but uh, unless uh, in the extension of the GACs, uh, we do not have uh, uh, an extension to the OTPs, uh, I won't see uh, such a large number of uh, 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 transactions of this kind, uh, while uh, maybe some uh, tactical uh, uh, transaction on, uh, on the residual portfolios, uh, uh, expecting the new wave of uh, uh, deterioration that uh, for sure will come in 2022. I think that uh, the challenge for 2021 will be rather uh, uh, to see how we should uh, tackle the increase in deterioration of the asset quality in 2022, also considering that a lot of uh, financing has been uh, refinanced uh, using the state guarantee. So basically we are sitting uh, over, uh, over a bump. So uh, my wonder is, uh, 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 we should all uh, think of a solution of uh, how to address uh, the fact that uh, many of those loans with the state guarantee will be will come into deterior in, in the deteriorated part of the portfolio. So, despite of the guarantee, for the bank is uh, still uh, something that uh, will increase the NPL ratio. And obviously, for from a state perspective, I mean, uh, I guess that. Uh, uh, we should find uh, uh, some uh, systemic solution because obviously it is irrealistic to think that uh, the state will be able uh, to front uh, uh, the guarantee uh, for all uh, uh, the guaranteed uh, loans that uh, will, uh, will become deteriorated. Okay, thanks very much Vittorio for taking the role of conclude this panel. Really, uh, I hope we brought to the table a lot of points for discussion and probably the people that listen to this panel have found useful. Clearly, a lot of things to be done in 2021 and the upcoming years, on uh, both on the seller perspective and uh, also clearly from an investor side. So good work, everyone, and uh, hopefully see you soon in a in the next panel. Thanks very much for your contribution.